Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Show Cloud uh, podcast. Uh, as usual, I'm joined by Hugh Rayner, um, one of our consultants within the team. So, welcome, Hugh. Hi, everyone. Welcome to well, welcome to the new the new morning slot on this lovely November morning. Right. So, we've got a couple of um, items that have come up over the last month that we just wanted to talk around and felt like they kind of related a little bit. There's a bit of a theme, um, and the theme is all around kind of I guess government level cyber activity. Let's say so. We've got. Um, we're going to talk about the Iranian-backed threat actors, which have uh, compromised the U.S. federal agency uh, via the log for shell vulnerability. Um, we have got a little bit of a commentary around the, the U.K. government that have committed uh, £6 million to Ukraine cyber defences. Uh, also related to the U.K. government, um, launching their vulnerability scanning programme, so scanning all um, U.K.-based um, externally facing IP addresses. We're going to dig into them and we'll kind of pull out some themes along the way. We got we did get a question as well from um, from one of the registrants. Uh, so we'll cover that as well towards the end of it. So on the first part of course is the, the Compromise US Federal Agency. So Hugh, um, can you just give me a little recap before we get started on the actual scenario here? Can you just recap me what Log4Shell is um, and when, when did we first hear about it? Yeah, so um, Log4Shell... Um... I imagine most people, by virtue of being on this call, probably uh, remember eleven months ago. Um, it was it was very big news then. Um, so yeah, a vulnerability in the um, Log4j Java logging framework that actually existed since two thousand and thirteen. Uh, we became aware of it last year, and it was um, pretty big because it was a you know trivial to exploit. Um, and affected hundreds of millions of devices, and it allowed remote code execution through um, I- injecting uh, strings into um, you know, into applications that would then get logged, and you know the the Java would then go away and, and pull a Java object off a malicious server and uh, start running it. So you know not good at all. Um, hence the the mad scramble at the tail end of last year, just before Christmas, to uh, batten down all the hatches. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, you're quite right. Eleven months old, and this is the this is the vulnerability right that's been used by the um, allegedly Iranian back threat actors. So they've compromised the U.S. federal agency using this vulnerability. I guess question I would have for you is: it's almost a year old the vulnerability, and actually existed, by, as you said, back to 2013. So how do we find ourselves in a position where that vulnerability still exists eleven months after it was initially discovered? So what what's Potentially, you know, maybe we can have a chat around what we think might have happened there. What's the what are the challenges to getting those things remediated in a, in a sensible time frame? Yeah, I mean, I guess first off, good to good to mention the fact that although it sounds awful, right, having this uh, CVSS ten issue out there for a year, um, it's not it's not hugely uncommon. You know, we still see um, you know Windows XP machines you know susceptible to things like Eternal Blue. Um, you know, that's 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 many years old now. Um, but but I guess the question here, yeah, is, is is how could that happen in a in a U.S. government department? Um, I think you know dealing with with the public sector, um, things can be more of a challenge in some areas than we would expect in in the private sector. Obviously, budgets are hugely constrained, um, so the available resources you've got to you know, working on on certain things might not be um, might not be as, as high as you'd expect in the private sector. And I think this one is particularly difficult because unless you've got a really comprehensive asset register of you know hardware and software assets, um, the 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 log4j framework is is a dependency as well, right? Used in in other applications and software from vendors. So unless you've got a completely comprehensive breakdown of you know all of the dependencies that the software you're using contains. Some people might not have even known that um, you know that Log4j was being being used as part of a as part of a solution. So yeah, absolutely knowing knowing those um, asset registers and things is is really important. Change management is also a thing I think in in the in the um, in the public sector that can be quite difficult, quite slow process to get things approved and moved. Certainly, you know, central government department. A lot of these systems are going to be really critical in nature. Downtime is not going to be acceptable. So anything that you know might need a reboot or a little bit of tinkering, people people are going to probably be um, you know more reluctant to to approve that. Changing priorities is probably also another big thing, I think. Um, and 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 that communication, you know, someone's tasked with something, um, but then something you know as it does all the time, really, something else more important comes in. You get different 
uh, pull from a different direction. Uh, so I think sort of a combination of factors really there that, that seem to affect um, the public sector more, more so than the private sector. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So a bit more of a, I guess a bit of a perfect storm of things happening. And I particularly, yeah, I, I agree particularly with point um, three, which is around the, yeah, the, the, the inability, maybe you don't even know it exists perhaps in your network. It might be, you know, in multiple locations across different software packages bundled in as, as a dependency or a library. And therefore it's really difficult then to detect that unless you've already kind of got the, the supply chain risk management piece really running well uh, across your you know, your media estate, but perhaps also your third parties' estates and so on and so forth. We've got a few people on the call. They'll be within organisations, you know, almost certainly in the private sector. What can they do now? What's what's kind of the takeaway here? What what can they do to make sure this doesn't happen to them that's happened to this US federal agency? Yeah, so I think, um, as we sort of touched on, really, um, a strong asset inventory um, is, is crucial. You can't patch, you can't update, you can't remediate issues that you don't know are there. So having a good view of the world um, and understanding your asset inventory, including software as well, and having key contacts um, against those. So, you know, if you've got a, a large vendor that you're relying on, having quick and easy access to, to their contact information should you need it. You know, for instance, to say, are you using Log4j as part of this application? Um, really important. I say secondly to that, looking for a, a good vulnerability management program. Again, it's all about being able to identify these issues, um, the, the ones that really catch people out are the unknown unknowns, right? Um, you might find that, oh, I didn't know this system was, was still online. I thought it was decommissioned three months ago. Well, if, if you think a system's decommissioned, no one's going to be in charge of deploying patches to it. And that's something we see quite a lot of. So a vulnerability management program to you know, completely scan all of your estate, especially the external perimeter, which is going to be getting scanned by hundreds of thousands of people anyway. Um, is really important and, and good that you know you need to know about that. And then I guess yeah, the other third thing is is probably ensuring that that clear communication um, and understanding of priorities, um, making sure you've got you know good dialogue with your team. If you've tasked them with something and then you task them with something else, you know you should be able to understand where you are with things. Um, you know, don't just take everything as as completed as soon as you've first issued it because a lot of a lot of this stuff you know especially for a, a large public sector organization could take a very long time to actually complete that task yeah exactly we've had a, we've had a question in actually during this it's very related so perhaps we'll, we'll cover that now so this is from claire so thank you claire um so claire said so we have a huge problem with third, third party suppliers not patching promptly for vulnerabilities so not necessarily a question a bit of a statement i think i would agree with her, and we see that regularly um so yeah you can look after all your own stuff as much as you like but supplier A, who's incredibly important for you, might not have the same level of um, interest, let's say, in doing the same thing. Um, what kind of immediate steps could someone like Claire take in order to kind of get the third parties that they're you know, using, so their suppliers, um, the vendors? How can they kind of enforce rules around that? How can they kind of push them down the right path and see that it's a, you know, the right thing to do? It's a good investment of time and resources, ultimately, uh, rather than just leaving it. Yeah, so I guess there's sort of two approaches here. Um might be a little bit late for for existing relationships but you know things like um you can you can include ask for it to be included in contract terms right um things like right of audit as well to re, to review um you know what what your supplier is doing really useful um you know just tell them you know okay i want to see what your sla is for remediating internal vulnerabilities um lots of lots of you know suppliers will do that I think secondly to that is um, you know, technical controls on your end as well. We're always talking about zero trust architecture. Um, you know, we, we, we want to be designing our systems, our environments in a way that nothing is trusted, right? Especially you know, third party suppliers because they are a big you know, gaping hole right into the middle of your, um, your infrastructure. Uh, so yeah, basically zero trust. Don't assume that anything coming from that supplier is, is, is trusted. Exactly, yeah. And I think also there's, there's probably an argument for, well, maybe in this case, it, uh, Claire might be referring to, they might use a third party company, for example, to manage their estate. For instance, it might be a you know managed service provider and they might not see the same level of relevance. So I guess there'll be, again, probably saying back to the same points around the, con the contractual side, so make sure that's ironed out ahead of time and, and that there are you know, specific SLAs in there for you know, a critical vulnerability of this nature needs to be remediated in X amount of time, for example, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a few things in there. But yeah, it's a it's a huge problem. The third party supplier uh, piece is a huge problem, not just necessarily on 
vulnerabilities, but across a whole range of issues as well. And it's something that I think businesses can struggle to get on top of. And I think ultimately it's, you know, kind of think about this, where there's not not a lot of emphasis on that third party supplier um, to need to to necessarily do something unless contractually they're obliged to do so, of course. So, yeah, big uh, a big a big area that's, I guess, mitigated a little bit, like you said, from architecting yourself properly and not allowing such wide access in from third parties and so on and so forth, you know, given the, the, the kind of least privileged model uh, is probably the, the right, right approach here. Excellent. Um, do we need to, anything else you want to cover off on the log for shell stuff and the way it's been used in this particular attack or do you want to move on to the next topic? Yeah, let's move on. Let's move on. Okay, good. So the next one was around um, the UK government committing uh, £6 million to Ukraine cyber defences. Um, this is a story from probably a couple of weeks ago. I don't think it's a huge secret. This kind of stuff going off and has been going off for a little while, but it's probably the first time that it's been um, kind of, you know, admitted to, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. I guess it's the first time it's been publicly known that this is happening and publicly acknowledged that this is happening. Um, so I guess first question here is why why would the UK government be offering the support? What's the what's the benefit here? No, I think, you know, we need to consider the fact that that warfare is, is evolving, right? Um, land sea air previously but you know cyber is is, is now absolutely the, the fourth domain of warfare um and you know it's 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 different right if someone fires a missile like you know everyone everyone can see that you can see the the, the action and the consequence um but you know with cyber warfare it can be more difficult you know especially some of the the activities that um russia are doing at the moment they're they're much less conspicuous um you know, but, but hugely impactful, things like spreading misinformation, really, really powerful techniques, um, as well as, you know, active exploitation and denial of service, which Russia are really hot on as well, um, preventing people from basically being able to, to get on with their lives. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, in cyber, just as much as, um, you know, physical warfare is really important that we, uh, you know, they're a NATO partner. It's important we support them. Yeah, no, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. And I guess you mentioned there disinformation. Um, so it's a when we talk about cyber warfare, we don't just mean someone's you know exploiting something that's hanging out on the internet, you know, a power station or a train station or a motorway gantry, whatever it might be, or the banks that underpin a society. But we're actually talking about the the movements that you might make within social media, that kind of thing, to to um, to destabilize you know a stable social model ultimately and that's kind of what we mean by disinformation so it can come from all sorts of angles right and it's not just where you know nation state a is going to attack you know country b for example um so yeah i think i would agree on all those parts um what, what kind of support is being offered under the agreement is that, is that level of detail available at, at this point in time yeah so um i guess it's it's at the end of the day it's uk taxpayer money that's being spent on this right so um you know the government have been quite quite open and forward with with what they're providing so i think we've got a list of uh, of what's currently been um offered so we're looking at things like incident response um you know helping helping the, the ukrainians recover from um cyber attacks malware attacks and things like that um also sort of network hardening um sort of consultancy and guidance around how to you know design their networks probably you know looking at zero trust architecture and things like that um, to prevent future incidents occurring, providing them hardware and software. So, um, you know, I imagine that's going to be sort of security tooling, setting up um, seams, socks, things like that to, to help them, um, you know, identify these, these attacks before they, uh, before they have a huge impact. And uh, yeah, like we mentioned, DDoS protection as well. Um, yeah, it seems like a, a trivial thing, right? A denial of service attack has been going on for, for donkey's years. Um, but when we're talking at the, the nation state level, you know, if you're taking down the, um, you know, take a, a UK analogy, if the NHS um, information pages went down, you know, people might be, have chest pains and not, and, you know, go to type it in on the NHS 111 and, 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 and you know, not get, be able to get that information. So even things which aren't, you know, warfare related, you know, denial of service at the um, national level, you know, is, is, is really impactful. And also, um, they, you know, they've been looking to provide some forensic capabilities as well, um, so that they can really, you know, deep dive into exactly the, the malware, the toolkits that are being deployed against them. Yeah, and I guess that helps us from a 
our country, you know, UK, helps us from a you know an, an understanding perspective. So what are we facing here? What what's the kind of you know TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that are happening actually in the real world at the moment in time? So I guess we're going to benefit a little bit from that as well. The insights we'll gain from that, which is good. Um, so that's all well and good. It's it's governmental level, country level stuff. How does that tie into the the organisation organisational space, the private sector space? So they get the people who are on this call generally. How can they? You know, read what's happening out there, and then kind of take that back to themselves, back to their own companies, and start to have a look at whether they should implement similar things. What's the tie in there? Yeah, so I think you know a lot of a lot of what is being done as part of this scheme for Ukraine is you know sort of directly um, translatable. The um, you know the, the threat model is different, right? These the, the Ukrainians are actively being you know aggressively targeted um, by foreign nation states, and you know fingers crossed. Not many private sector organisations, certainly, uh, you know, on this call would would find themselves in a similar position. Something's really gone quite wrong if you are. Um, but you know, the the the, the processes we're doing, um, the sort of wider cyber transformation piece, upskilling, um, network hardening, all of that sort of stuff is you know is is absolutely um, you know easy to not easy to replicate, but important to replicate. Um, and it can be scaled, you know, proportionally to the, to a small organisation or, or or a nation, really. Yeah, and I guess the principles are right. That it's, it's I like to think of security as a, an onion, I guess. And in terms of the many layers of, of where you want to be, so you peel back an onion, you've got a layer. Peel back again, you've got another layer. And when you're talking about uh, implementing uh, defences in depth, then you're better off with a much, you know, a, a multi-layered approach rather than just relying on one single piece of work. The things that they're happening there, all the kind of support that we're that we're offering, and I'm not sure it's not just us. I'm sure there are other uh, nations around the world doing exactly the same thing. Um, those are constituent. Those constituent parts are elements of a good layered security program. I think so. I think people on this call can take that away and actually start to look at what's offered there and look and say, you know, how, what do we do in the incident response space? Do we have someone on hand to do forensic work for us? You know, is our vulnerability management um, uh, program is it adequate? Is it doing what we need it to do? We're getting the results out of it, and so on and so forth. So I think there's certainly things that people can take away from here on this on this on this kind of piece that we're looking at here, and, and take that back and start to implement that. Um, I guess final question on this one here is six million quid sounds a lot to me. I'd, you know, if, if I had six million quid in the bank, I'd be quite happy. But um, in the grand scheme of things, from a from a UK government level, that's just pocket change ultimately, right? So it doesn't sound like a huge amount. What, what what kind of things can people get for six million quid? I guess. Well, I mean, you can see large um you know large private sector multinationals engage in in cyber transformation projects uh you know four million or so value for sort of uh, you know just a couple of years um so really when you're scaling that out to an entire nation no that's that's hardly anything at all really right you look at the um the average cost of of you know deploying a missile or something like that you wouldn't get many missiles out for your six million quid so you know, really, the fact that they've, um, you know, the, the stuff they've documented, they've gotten done, um, is is quite impressive. Really, um, wouldn't understand. Well, I wouldn't know for sure what the extent was, but I can't imagine that it's, you know, hugely detailed or um, you know goes very deep or or indeed, um, you know, wide across the across the country for six million pounds. Because yeah, it, it certainly wouldn't get you much. Yeah, exactly. We've had a question in from Jeff around SOC two type, uh, SOC type two reporting, and, and, and how that relates to supplier assurance. Now, before we go on to the next question, do we want to cover that now? And obviously, it'll tie into more so the first piece, the first bullet point that we covered off. Yeah, sure. Do you want to do you want to take yeah. that, or shall I? Um, I mean, do you want to take it first, then we'll we'll kind of go in together as we're going along. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I think SOC two reports um, can be really can be really useful. Um, even even uh, you know with with the content of the report set aside uh, the fact that an organization has gone out and got a SOC2 report um, is is almost you know a really good indicator anyway um, it's you know it, it basically shows that they're they're interested in and in, in looking out for that stuff um, but yeah also it, it really helps you right you you get an understanding of the controls and mitigations and things that that they've implemented. 
um, and, and you know, looking at the, the items raised in that report, you can say, okay, this looks like their controls are in line with, with the standards that we set for ourselves in our organization, or you know, they fall short. And so therefore we're going to ask them to also consider, you know, this in the contract, or okay, these guys are, you know, way, way ahead of us in terms of their controls, probably pretty safe. You know, they'll, they'll, if they're showing you a SOC 2 report, they're also probably going to be happy to share with you, you know, their, their ISO accreditations and things like that as well. So, yeah, it can be a really good indicator of um, who you're working with. Yeah, I think I could agree with that. I think what it does do is it, even if you don't look at the content of it so heavily, you just kind of say, well, it's a SOC 2 report, I'm happy with that. What it means is they're taking it seriously, ultimately. So there's a bit of investment. It's not an easy thing to get through. You have to collate a lot of data. So if you looked at an, an organization and your supply chain came and said along, you know, we, we're SOC type 2 compliant, we've got ISO 27001 and any other ISO 27K related standards, you kind of look at that and go, I see, you know what, you're probably taking things quite seriously. The SOC type 2 um, structure, I, I quite like the way it's put together. I think it covers quite a nice broad range of areas. Um, and I think, yeah, I think crucially those two bits together. What it doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that a supplier is infallible, won't have ever have an issue or compromise. But what it means is probably they're in a good position to recover from that. So you can take some comfort from that around your supply chain. I think if if everybody in the supply chain had a, that level of um, uh, accreditation um, and the other ISO and all these kind of other bits and pieces, yeah, you kind of go, actually, you know, I think we're in a strong position here. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So hopefully that answered the, the question for you, Jeff. Um, so final point we were going to cover today, Hugh, was around the, the UK government. So back to the UK government again. Um, and they announced that they were launching a, a UK-wide vulnerability scanning program. So I guess what that means is that anyone with an address space or an IP address in the UK address space um, is likely to get a vulnerability scanned at some point. So can you just give us a bit more of a detail on what that means, Hugh? What, what's kind of the implication of this here? What's, you know, what's the kind of new story? Yeah, so I guess... First off is is let's define vulnerability scanning, right? So we might consider um, the sort of vulnerability scanning that we do for a client, um, and 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 this is, it's it's not the same, right? So our vulnerability scans are going to be you know probing for detailed information, um, you know highlighting things that that might be susceptible to exploitation. Certainly, um, you know this isn't what the NCSC are doing. Um, that's that's quite sort of computationally expensive as well. They're looking for um, responses to web requests. They're probing services for version numbers. They're looking for sensitive information that might be disclosed um, in responses and, and accessible from servers. Um, so it's it's not you know that that deep dive probing. Um, it's sort of surface level information gathering that they're looking to do. Yeah. Okay. And why would they be doing this? I guess is the next question. Yeah. So um, I think. You know, in terms of why they're doing it, it, it makes sense and it seems quite good, right? So they're looking to build up a picture of the um, of the cyber landscape in the UK. Um, so obviously, if they're they're constantly scanning these the, the UK address space, you know, even twice a month or so. Um, I don't know how frequently it's going to be, but say it's twice a month, um, they're able to then look at uh, patching trends. See, okay, this there'll be there'll be to, first off they'll be able to see you know what technologies are in use, okay. X number of organizations are, uh, using Apache on their on their web servers, something like that. They'll be able to see, okay, Apache have released an update on the um, you know the twenty fourth of November. Um, you know, ten percent of organizations had that update deployed um, within the or by the time of the the, the next scan. You know, fifty percent by two scans in time. So they're able to build up a picture of you know patching and remediation trends across the country. Um, and you know vulnerability exposure over time, which I think is really useful. Um, and you know, unless you're investing a lot in a vulnerability management program, um, you know, it's not really the sort of information that an organisation might be able to to you know note note down, document themselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think there's a few principles that they've, they've outlined as well, which is minimal data uh, collection. I think is what they said. So um, they're endeavouring to not collect personal identifiable information, so PII, the minimizing the data they do collect and say, look, we're just going to have enough to prove that this exists. So, you know, kind of grab the versions, like you said. Um, it's almost like kind of, is this port open? And I do a banner grab of it. I'm, like I say, I'm not entirely sure it's doing a full 
fully fledged vulnerabilities assessment, let's say, or an audit of the, the services that's there. Um, but they also said that this is the first kind of step of it, ultimately it can and probably will evolve into something else. And maybe down the line, it will become a bit more um, fully fledged, a bit more uh, featureful, for example. Um, but I guess the question people might on the call might have is, is this likely to affect them? You know, is this, if they get scammed by the UK government, is, is it likely to cause some outages, any problems, that kind of thing? Uh, so if if it would, that would be a huge concern because, you know, so this is, um, obviously they're not in your network, right? So this is, this is a scans of um, publicly facing external assets, which are, you know, almost certainly, if they've been online for more than 10 minutes, um, they're going to be getting scanned relentlessly um, all day long by, uh, you know, bots and, and, and threat actors. Um, and certainly, um, you know, those, uh, those malicious scans will be probing a lot harder. Um, so for instance, the government, if they find you've got, um, you know, FTP open and enabled, like, like Nick said, they'll be probably just doing a banner grab to get the version and, and things like that. Um, they're not going to be trying to actually connect to that service. Whereas, um, you know, some of the, the the botnets that are scanning the internet, if they find your your FTP server, they'll they'll try logging in, you know, as the uh, as the anonymous user, see if they can access any files. You know, they're going to actually dive into these services. Um, so certainly, um, you know, if, if you're not already experiencing issues, this isn't going to contribute. Yeah, I mean, it's worth pointing out as well that businesses can opt out of this. So you can email the NCSC and say, please don't scan these addresses and then they'll, they'll exclude them from the scans. And so it is worth noting that it's not, you can opt out of it ultimately. Um, final question, Hugh, is this legal? So we obviously know about the Computer Misuse Act as a um, as a security consultancy ourselves, we'll be very you know, much adhering to that. Um, and we wouldn't be out there just scan, scanning random IP addresses that don't belong to us and don't belong to any of our customers. We ain't got an authorization to do so. So is it, I guess the question is, is this legal? Well, I mean, I, 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 I suppose by virtue of the fact that this exists, that someone has probably decided, yes, it is legal. Um, but certainly I would not, um, you know, I, I wouldn't go and go and scan these IP addresses randomly. Um, I mean, the computer misuse act is, um, well, it's quite an old piece of legislation now, not not modern, not really fit for purpose. Um, you know, technically, you could argue that um, accessing a website that someone's told not not specifically told you you can access could be a violation of the Computer Misuse Act because you're not authorized um, yet. You've you know secured access to that system. Um, you know, it, the the cru the crucial part of the legislation is. Um, that just because something is publicly accessible doesn't mean that that's akin to authorization. Um, so yeah, it's 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 old legislation, not really fit for purpose. Um, but I suppose you know it's 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 being done so widespread. Um, we hardly see any prosecutions for the Computer Misuse Act anyway. Um, if people actually do anything, they tend to get charged with things like you know fraud, um, which carry much easier easier to prove. For the police and a jury um, carry harsher sentences as well. Um, so, so yeah, basically, um, nothing, nothing would happen even if it was, wasn't legal. Okay, and it's worth pointing out that the, the, there's a campaign, and it's run by you know colleagues from other businesses in the industry that are trying to get the, the computer misuse act updated to something a bit more modern, a bit more sensible. So, certainly, a campaign. I, I, I would agree with the principles of it. I think they're in the right ballpark of, of having it updated and, up and changed. And therefore, this might well then activity it happens anyway. So therefore, this activity might then become an okay thing to do. Um, who knows? I guess it's the questions there, isn't it? Okay, so I think that probably just about covers us off for today, Hugh. But know we had one final question, um, which I think I'm going to take the answer for, if that's all right. So um, fire away, and then we'll I'll cover that one off. Yeah, sure. So I think it. Um... So we put out the the bullet points um, that we, the things we'd be covering in this in this session a few days ago, um, and I think it pertains to the the one around um, the, the the scanning that we've just talked about. Um, and the question is, how can this be used in an, in an operational technology environment supporting IEC six two four four three? Excellent, thank you. Right, so I'll pick that one up. Um, so there's a two, there's, there's multiple parts, right, to the 62443 standard. And there are two here that are probably relevant to this question. So part two, three uh, is related to patch management. And I'll cover that one in a second. 
part three one is the one you're referring to, right? So part three one is the network and system security um, parts of the standard. There is a section in there that talks about vulnerability scanners or vulnerability scanning, um, recommends that you should do it for an OT environment and so on and so forth. With regards to this UK government vulnerability scanning program, is it going to be of use to kind of cover that requirement off in the 62443 standard? My view is probably not. Um, and that's, the, the reasons it's probably not is because the standard itself is referring to um, more so your operational technology environment. And if that's hanging out on the internet, you know, not through any other layers and no, no other controls in place, and we've got probably a bigger problem than just being scanned by the UK government. Um, it does recommend that you do do scanning. And I think what the, the, the technology that the government will be using will not be tuned or able to do proper OT level scanning. So you can run, you know, various off the shelf commercial scanners against an OT environment. Ness has been one example, for example, you know, for instance, and there are many others on the market. They might not give you a particularly good picture of what's happening in the OT space. They're not tuned for that. There's not a, a tool for the, it's the wrong tool for the, for the job ultimately. Um, so whilst it's, potentially going to pick some stuff up on the perimeter. I wouldn't necessarily rely on it as being, yeah, we covered that piece off from the um, from the standard ultimately. Now, there's another way of looking at that question, um, which is probably related to part one of this, this threat brief, which is the log for shell stuff and talking about patch management. So in there, in that piece of the standard, it talks about maintaining inventories of software, hardware, all the other kind of bits and pieces, kind of the points that you mentioned earlier on, Hugh. Um, so yes, there is a section in there around patch management and particularly around the inventories of what you're using in this OT environment. You know, what's the what are the software packages are made, so what are the dependencies for those software packages, what are the versions that they're running off, and so on and so forth. So there is a section in there around that, which would, if you had that in good in a, in a good place, you would kind of adhere into the control framework, that would have obviously helped you find the log for shell um instances uh, well ahead of time. Ultimately, so I think there was a couple of couple of parts to the sixty four four three standard which could relate to that question uh, and the things that we've covered off today. Uh, there's a question in um, as well from Samir: uh, Will it be a paid service to solve the vulnerabilities, um, or is it an awareness program? And I think that's related to the, the government scanning one. Um, so, Samir, the answer is it's the, it's the latter. So it's an awareness program. It's not it's not something the government are charging for. And um, I also don't think they're doing any remediation of it either. So they'll just let you know if there's anything glaringly obvious there. They'll let the, the owner of that net block say this IP has this problem on it. You might want to have a look at it and sort it out. So as far as I'm aware, at the minute it's, it's just a free, it's a free, obviously it's paid for by the by taxes and stuff like that, but um free, free in at the point of use, I guess is what it is. I think at this point it might even be um a step back from that. I I think at the moment, you know, like we said, this is this is step one of the deployment. I think at the moment it is it is more just an information gathering exercise um, that, that, that the NCSC will then be able to, to process and, and determine outputs from. Um, I, I, you know, I certainly wouldn't expect uh, an email, um, you know, personally written to you. Hi there. Um, looks like you've got a vulnerability on, uh, on this service running on your, your external estate at the moment. No, um, I think it's going to be for, you know, big data, gathering and, and crunching and processing and you know if they do see that a large number of organizations have got the same vulnerability i, I would anticipate there'd be you know, a widespread um just bulletin basically explaining uh you know x percentage of people are vulnerable to this we need to crack on and sort it out yeah i mean look if they are doing notifications of stuff that's bad in the scene it's going to be challenging to kind of work out who owns an address space because the who is data is can protect it can be hidden it's not necessarily always accurate for instance if you're using like a shared hosting service you're not going to be identified as the owner of that shared service for instance so yeah there's a couple of question marks i think ultimately and i guess how it works in practice will be really key to how it's you know the success of it ultimately cool um anything else you want to cover you anything any other points you want to add in there no i think that's a pretty good coverage of those three topics okay good so appreciate we've run over i do apologize everyone um this is actually our last one for the year. Um, so we're going to take a break in December, celebrate the holidays and all that kind of good stuff. And we will be back in uh, January. Um, we will get some content out over um, the December period, no doubt. Um, just won't be in this kind of live format, uh, ultimately. But thanks, everyone, for your support through the year. Thanks, for everyone, for coming along to the, the sessions repeatedly. I see the same some some of the same names in um, week and week and month in, month out, sorry. And it's really, really nice for us to have that kind of cadence. So. Again, appreciate it. Um, 
see you all in January and thank you very much for um for your time and for, for attending today.